Okay, so we're going to get started here. Uh, may hopefully don't have any technical issues here. Uh, so uh, tonight is uh, uh, lecture number 10, advanced dry needling of the wrist and hand. So as we start here, we're now going to be getting into uh, some of the more technical uh, pieces that we see with dry needling. Uh, a lot of structures in the wrist and in the hand, uh, a lot more uh, precision required for uh, identifying, especially when it comes to uh, all the ligaments uh, associated with the wrist and the hand. Uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll guide you through uh, that piece and um, give you the framework that you can um, expertly dry needle in that area with everything that you need to do. So we'll look here. Um, what we're gonna go through tonight, we'll look at, um, uh, as far as our muscles, uh, we'll start with our multi-articulate muscles, those muscles that uh, are, are in the forearm that extend across into the hand, uh, controlling the fingers. Uh, there we're talking abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and longus, palm, uh, flexor pollicis longus, and the palmaris brevis. Uh, then all of those, uh, again, just for the thumb, and then palmaris brevis. Uh, we'll look at extensor indices, extensor digiti minimi, extensor digitorum, and then the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. Once we get through that, then what we're going to do is take a look at the muscles in the hand themselves. On the thenar eminent side, we'll look at abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, and opponent's pollicis. And uh, we'll look at ab adductor pollicis, and we'll move to the hypothenar eminence. Uh, there we'll have the abductor digiti minimi, uh, the flexor pollicis brevis, um, I'm sorry, the flexor digiti minimi and the opponent's digiti minimi. From there, we'll look at the three layers, the, the, the dorsal and the palmar interossei and the lumbricals. There are an inordinate amount of tendons and ligaments. Uh, primarily everything here is ligamentous in nature. Uh, then we'll look at our, our regional diagnosis protocols uh, followed by um, uh, our, our perineural protocol. Uh, most of the other uh, nerves we dealt with in the elbow here, we're going to focus solely on the median nerve. So just looking at one uh, study that uh, I pulled up, uh, and this was published in, in 2018, so it's a few years old. Um, and this has really more to do, I could have included this in the, in the lecture on the elbow, uh, but it had to do with um, a case of a 27-year-old who uh, presented to orthopedic outpatient department with a one month history of left wrist drop following dry needling. So what ended up happening is um, patient went in uh, with some issues, person was doing some dry needling. Um, they don't tell us exactly where uh, this took place as far as uh, location in, in upper extremity, uh, but went on, um, started developing some, some wrist drop, uh, which you would normally see with uh, uh, radial nerve pulse with, with the hand dropping down. Here's my camera. There we are, that normal uh, radial nerve palsy that we see. Um, they uh, did an EMG, uh, did everything they needed to. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there was the, the injury was attributed to the dry needling. Uh, and we say that uh, to indicate that uh, even though complications are rare, you do need to pay very close attention to where you are kneeling uh, to, to make sure that you don't end up uh, kneeling into something that you don't need to. Uh, normally I give out to just, you know, positive uplifting, oh, dry kneeling is the greatest thing ever. Uh, but we have to be aware that there are complications as we get into the wrist and hand, our window of, of, of action gets even smaller. So being aware of where specifically here, the median nerve uh, travels through that uh, median um, that carpal tunnel. Uh, gives us a good idea of where we need to go, where we don't need to go. Um, so just a little bit of um, a backdrop to uh, how we need to be cautious on, 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 our, on our spacing, on our location, uh, using our finger breads, using our surface anatomy uh, to know exactly where uh, we're advancing these needles. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this uh, for the, the wrist and the hand. Uh, as If you were doing the, the 3D kinetic screen, uh, you would absolutely be able to uh, look at any sort of limitation that might be happening, uh, especially with some of the motions that are involved, uh, the shoulder. Um, 
and, and some of the diagonal movements uh, that we see with that. Uh, so uh, we'll get more into that, uh, the 3D kinetic screen, whenever we start the next lecture dealing with the hip. So to save us some time, um, we've watched this video before. I'm not going to play it again here. Uh, so let's start uh, directly into the multi-articulate muscles. Again, the muscles involving the thumb, index finger, the digits uh, individually uh, or as a unit, uh, and then the, the long flexor uh, muscles. Uh, so I'm going to move here and change my share. Let's go ahead and pull up our complete anatomy. Again, all of our... our um, 3D anatomy is uh, provided with permission through uh, 3D anatomy through Elsevier uh, Corporation. Um, they do a great job with this product. And uh, again, I don't care which one a person uses, uh, but being able to view things in uh, three dimensions is, uh, is critical for knowing what we're, uh, what we're dealing with. So let's just start with these and start un undoing, um, unwrapping this onion, if you will, um, on the... Um, on the lateral aspect, uh, let me close. Uh, okay, on the lateral aspect. Uh, again, some of these we've already touched base on uh, whenever we talked about the elbow, uh, but we'll just uh, briefly cover them again. Uh, extensor digitorum uh, with its origin, lateral epicondyle, uh, and it inserts into the dorsal aspects, the bases of both the middle and the distal flanges of the, uh, the index, middle ring, and little fingers. So extensor digitorum. When we're palpating for that muscle, we do the, the playing the piano um, uh, business. Uh, so that's what we look for there. On, on the next, I'm going to go ahead and, and hide that. From there, we will look at the extensor digiti minimi. Again, similar uh, origin on the lateral epicondyle. And uh, again, it's termination out similar uh, at the extensor expansion of the little finger. Uh, again, when we're palpating for that, um, fairly difficult to, to break it out between extensor digitorum, but if we just target uh, the, uh, the, the pinky finger, uh, that can be done. We'll move, let's go ahead and move to the flexors next. I'm gonna pause momentarily. Do you mind plugging this in? Battery's kind of low on that. Great technical issue there. Uh, first, let's look at uh, flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, again, it has uh, an attachment uh, both on the, um, if you need to just keep that on there, you um, Or John medial epicondyle, uh, and also down on the ulna as well. And then it's attachment down insertion. Uh, palmar aspects of the bodies of the middle phalanges, index, middle ring, and little fingers. Um, so we hide that. That gets us into flexor digitorum profundus. Uh, again, this, this has only an ulnar uh, attack, uh, origin. Um, and it's insertion. Again, palmar aspects of the base of the distal phalanges, index, middle ring, and little fingers. So that's where we come up with the profundus grip. Um, by nature of its uh, insertion. So we'll hide that. And we'll look one more here, palmaris longus. Uh, again, a lot of the, the connective tissue is, is taken out, uh, but if you resist that wrist uh, flexion, that is that tendon that pops up into that uh, uh, flexor retinaculum um, at, at the carpal row. Um, in its origin, medial epicondyle uh, via the common flexor uh, tendon. So let's hide that, and then let's get into um, included pronator quadratus here, um, simply because its location to the wrist has very little to do with uh, wrist function other than uh, pronation uh, at that area, along with pronator teres. Again, it's uh, origin insertion, radius and ulna, um, and we will look at dry needling this. We may have done it in the elbow as well, but we'll definitely look at it here as well. Um, so let's pull that out of our way. And um, 
because it doesn't really fit anywhere else. I included Palmaris Brevis. Um, it, it, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more as we get to it. Um, its uh, origin is just on the palmar aponeurosis, the flexor retinaculum of the hand, and inserts along the medial margin of the hand. So uh, it, it, it is muscle that really just kind of bump, bumps that muscle uh, together, gives us a little crease in the medial and lateral aspect uh, of, of the digit um, there on the hypothenar eminence. So we'll pull that away and let's do extensor indices. And then we can get to the muscles of the thumb. So extensor indices, uh, origin on the posterior surface, distal one third of the ulna uh, and the interosseous membrane and inserts in the extensor expansion of the index finger. Uh, again, a lot, of, a lot of these muscles will find that uh, we have uh, a bigger role, a bigger impact uh, dealing with hemiplegia uh, and, and tone related to uh, the, the muscles uh, of, of the hand. Uh, there are other um, indications for kneeling these areas uh, but any of those things that cause contracture or um, lack of motor control, uh, dry needling these targeted areas uh, can be very helpful. So we'll move on to the muscles of the thumb. So we'll start with extensor pollicis longus. Um, here, origin on the posterior surface, middle one third of the ulna, uh, and in certain the, the dorsal aspect of the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. So that's what really gives us that, that extension moment uh, there at the thumb. We'll move to the abductor pollicis longus. Um, again, it's uh, origin, um, proximal half the ulna, middle third of the radius. Uh, so it, uh, again, another one of those muscles that has uh, uh, attachment or origin on both radius and ulna. Uh, and it's you know, rotate here, it's uh, insertion lateral aspect, base of the first metacarpal. And that's with that uh, insertion, uh, definitely what gives us that lateral abduction moment. Uh, we come down, hide that, and we'll look at the extension pollicis brevis. Again, so here uh, we're going to be in that interosseous membrane, but also onto the um, onto the radius uh, it inserts in dorsal aspect base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. Uh, so longus was uh, attaching more um, proximally and then brevis is attaching or inserting a little bit more distally, again, to give us a little bit more control over that extension movement. And then finally, rotate here and then we'll see Take a look at the flexor pollicis longus. Uh, flexor pollicis brevis, we'll, we'll see on the thumb a little bit later. It doesn't cross uh, the carpal, so I don't include that here, but we will get to it in our dry needle. Uh, flexor pollicis longus, um, origin, anterior surface of the radius. Uh, and again, that interosseous membrane between radius and ulna. And then it's uh, insertion into the palmar aspect, the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. And so uh, that gives us that our flexor movement. Uh, the, all the opposition we'll find uh, happens um, um, in the intrinsic muscles of the thenar um, muscle of the thumb and then the hypothenar for the, uh, the pinky finger. Okay, so let's jump away from there. And let me come back. All right. Okay, here we are. So for abductor pollicis longus, uh, again, we've discussed um, origin, innervation. I'm gonna skip that since we just discussed what we have there, uh, extension pollicis longus. Uh, again, I'm gonna be brief uh, since we covered that through the 3D anatomy piece. Let's come all the way down to multi-articulate muscles. We've already done it, so I don't have to do it the second time. That would be silly. Uh, treatment. All right. For abductor pollicis longus, uh, our, our, you know, we've talked about origin insertion. So here um, with um, patient, again, supine arm on abdomen, 
um, I say supine again, our first roll, uh, first time kneeling a person, uh, best to be supine or prone. Uh, in a case where you can have working on a person's hand, wrist, forearm, if you can have them in a seated position with supported, uh, with a, with, in, in a chair with a, a back support, uh, the arm on a, an appropriate uh, treatment table, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, so here, uh, again, we bisect the forearm and half midpoint of the upper half will palpate the dorsal surface closer to the ulnar border. Uh, and then you have the patient abduct the thumb to isolate abductor pollicis longus. We'll bracket the muscle belly and then we'll drip needle directed toward the ulna. All right, let's come to video here. Huh. Abductor pollicis longus uh, position is going to be supine uh, with the arm on the abdomen. Needle length will be three centimeters with the back drop down to the ulna. We will bisect the forearm in half. And at the midpoint here in the upper half, we're going to palpate the dorsal surface closer to the ulnar border as you have the patient abduct the thumb to isolate abductor pollicis longus. We'll bracket the muscle belly and then we'll needle directed more toward the ulna <coughs> here in midpoint. So very helpful as you go through <clears throat> the multi-articulate muscles, uh, as you try to perform the motions to isolate that, uh, I've given very um, detailed location, um, but understanding that as you uh, evaluate your patient, and, and, and have them abduct that thumb, um, you'll, you'll appreciate their anatomical structure a little bit better uh, to isolate uh, that particular muscle. All right, so let's move here. Okay, and so extensor pollicis brevis. Uh, here, uh, we're gonna be uh, three to four finger breadths proximal. Uh, to the distal radius, it's going to be on the dorsal surface. We're going to palpate for extensor pollicis brevis as the patient abducts the thumb. We're going to bracket the muscle belly and the needle directed towards the radius. Uh, so it says abducts. Abducts with a combination of extension. Well, we'll get that since extensor pollicis brevis, uh, those sit very closely together, but we want to make sure that we target that. Again, it's going to be three to four finger breaths from the distal radius. For extensor pollicis brevis, patient position will be supine with the arm on the abdomen. Needle length will be about two centimeters. Backdrop here down to the radius. At three to four finger breaths proximal to the distal radius on the dorsal surface, we'll palpate for extensor pollicis brevis as the patient addu abducts the thumb, abducts or extends. We'll bracket this muscle belly. We'll needle directly toward the radius. Definitely palpable as extending or abducting. Again, three to four finger breaths. Okay, so extensor pollicis longus. Here what will be one palm breadth proximal to the distal ulna, dorsal surface again, palpating uh, for extensor pollicis longus as the patient abducts the thumb. Again, I say abduct. It is going to be more the, the, the extension. I'll go back and I'll edit that to show that. But uh, abduction extension has very similar um, location with the muscle. So uh, direct that a little bit more to the extension and then abduction. We'll, we'll bracket that muscle belly and then needle directed towards the ulna. So again, here we're gonna be one palm breadth, whereas previously we were three to four finger breaths. For extensor pollicis longus, position is supine, arm on the abdomen, needle length here is two centimeters. At one, one palm breadth proximal to the distal ulna, on the dorsal surface, we're going to palpate for the extensor pollicis longus. 
as the patient abducts or extends the thumb. We're gonna bracket the muscle belly and we'll needle directed towards the ulna. So our one palm breadth on the ulnar side, extensor pollicis longus to the ulna. Okay, so then over onto the flexor side, uh, flexor pollicis longus. Uh, we'll palpate flexor pollicis longus. Uh, do that by placing our palpating fingers on the molar uh, aspect, right, molar radial aspect in the distal half of the forearm. We're gonna isolate the muscle by resisting IP thumb flexion. We're gonna needle from one, from anterior to posterior, one, one palm breadth proximal to the carpal crease uh, with the radius as our backdrop. So again, one, uh, one palm breadth there. For flexor pollicis longus, patient again, supine position, um, forearm is resting on a pillow. So in this position, needle length here is about three centimeters back drop down to the radius. Uh, to palpate the flexor pollicis longus, we're gonna place our palpating fingers on the volar radial aspect in the distal half of the forearm. And we're gonna isolate the muscle by resisting thumb flexion. Again, on the radial side, resisting that thumb flexion. And it'll pop, pop right there. We're gonna needle from anterior to posterior, one palm breadth proximal to the carpal crease with the radius as the backdrop. Right there. As you can tell, a lot of muscles, when we get to the ligaments, lots of ligaments in the wrist and hand. Um, one of the reasons why it's uh, very convenient to have uh, the, the app that's being developed uh, to follow all of these, uh, it's, unless you needle the wrist and hand on a consistent daily basis, it's very hard to remember all of the exact placement and location. Uh, so take advantage, use that app, use that information uh, to help identify these, uh, these things. Uh, so on the palmaris brevis, uh, here, um, uh, it can be easily palpated by having the patient flex the fifth metacarpal while palpating the hook of the hamate. We're going to lo locate the hook of the hamate, then, then one finger breadth toward the MCP joint will needle toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. Um, here, the needle location very near or the same as the abductor digiti minimi, which we will get to uh, shortly. Palmaris brevis uh, position is supine. The shoulder adduct, abducted 30 degrees. Forearm is supinated, resting on the pillow. Needle length is about one and a half centimeters, and our backdrop is down to the fifth metacarpal. The palmaris brevis can be easily palpated by having the patient flex the fifth metacarpal while palpating the hook of the hamate. We'll locate the hook of the hamate, and then one finger breadth toward the MCP joint will needle uh, toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. Um, needle location here is very near, um, the same as the uh, adductor digiti minimi. Right there. Okay, then for extensor indices, uh, it'll be three to four finger breadths proximal to the ulnar styloid process, dorsal surface, We'll palpate for extensor indices as the patient obviously extends the index finger. We'll bracket that uh, muscle belly and needle directed towards the ulna. Again, it's going to be three to four finger breaths uh, from the distal ulna. So we'll palpate that to, to find uh, our location. For the extensor indices, here the arm will be uh, patient supine, arm is on the abdomen. Uh, needle length will be two centimeters with a back backdrop down to the ulna. Here uh, at three to four finger breadths proximal to the ulnar styloid process, which we palpate, locate ulnar styloid process. Um, well, on, the, on the dorsal surface, we'll palpate for the extensor indices as the patient extends the index finger. We're gonna bracket the muscle belly and we'll needle directed toward the ulna.
right there. So as you're watching the, the demonstration here, uh, obviously that's me needling or, or demonstrating on myself. Giving your patient some resistance to the uh, to these movements makes it a little bit easier to, to, to get a little bit more bulk out of these smaller muscles. Uh, as I sit here talking to you and giving myself a little resistance, uh, it definitely makes it easier. So um, if you're having difficulty, uh, give, give a little bit of resistance uh, in those regards. Okay, and then extensor digiti minimi. Here we'll palpate uh, EDM by placing our palpating fingers on the dorsal ulnar aspect of this, the third of the forearm, isolating the muscle by resisting IP or pinky extension. Uh, we'll needle from anterior posterior, one palm breadth proximal to the carpal crease with the medial ulna as the backdrop. So we're gonna, again, uh, the dorsal carpal crease, uh, one palm breadth uh, more proximally, and then that's gives us our needle location. For the extensor digiti minimi, uh, patient will be in the supine position, hand is resting on the stomach. Knee length is about three centimeters. Uh, here to palpate uh, extensor digiti minimi, uh, we'll place our palpating fingers, fingers on the dorsal ulnar aspect and the distal third of the forearm. And then we're gonna isolate the muscle by resisting um, IP pinky extension. We'll needle from anterior to posterior, one palm breadth proximal to the carpal crease with a medial ulna as the backdrop. And then extensor digitorum. Um, again, this is where we have our patients uh, play the piano. Here we're gonna needle this more proximally closer uh, to the elbow, it'll be about four finger breaths from the radial head. Again, this is uh, some stuff that we covered uh, dealing with the elbow. For but extensor digitorum, uh, this patient will be supine, the arm placed on the abdomen. Needle length will be three centimeters, and our backdrop here is down to the ulna. We'll have the patient uh, lay the fingers on the abdomen and slowly play the piano. And that's going to help us isolate extensor digitorum. We're gonna find the superior and the inferior margins while they continue to move those fingers. And we're gonna bracket the muscle belly three to four finger breaths distal to the radial head and a needle uh, directed toward the ulna. So we find the radial head and then we're gonna needle through towards the ulna. As an alternative approach, you will pass just anterior to the radius headed towards the ulna. As an alternate approach here, locating uh, extensor digitorum, that can be um, threaded. Uh, we can look at that a little bit more when we get into the lab um, later in, in the course. Uh, but that, again, an alternate way of, of needling extensor digitorum. The flexor digitorum profundus and then superficialis. Uh, we'll look at both and then we'll let both play. Uh, here, um, we'll place our palpating fingers on the belly of um, flexor carpi radialis. We'll have patient flex and extend the fingers at the DIP and the DI, PIP and DIP joint. And then four finger breaths distal to the pupillar crease. We'll needle into anterior posterior direction with the ulna as a backdrop uh, being profundus. It is a very deep muscle and you have to pass, pass through uh, flexor carpi radialis and flexor digitorum superficialis before you reach the profundus. Uh, FCR mentioning that it does sit even more superficial than uh, flexor uh, digitorum superficialis. Uh, so again, on that one, we'll place fingers on the bellies of FCR and palmaris longus uh, to have the patient flex, extend the fingers at the PIP joint, uh, midpoint of the forearm between FCR and palm palmaris longus. We'll needle anterior to posterior, uh, with no backdrop. So let's come look at 10 and 11. For the flexor digitorum profundus, patient's gonna be supine. The shoulder will be abducted about 30 degrees with the forearm supinated, resting on a pillow. Needle length here will be three to four centimeters. Our backdrop will be down to the ulna. We're gonna place our palpating fingers on the belly of flexor carpi radialis. We're gonna have our patient flex 
and extend the fingers at the PIP and the DIP joint. At four finger breadths distal to the cubital crease, we're gonna needle in an anterior to posterior direction with the ulna as a backdrop. This is a deep muscle and we must pass through flexor carpi radialis and flexor digitorum superficialis before reaching flexor digitorum profundus. For flexor digitorum superficialis, position is going to be supine, shoulder abducted 30 degrees with the forearm supinated and resting on uh, the pillow. Needle length here will be three centimeters and there is no backdrop. We'll place our palpating fingers between the bellies of flexor carpi radialis and palmaris longus. We're going to have our patient flex and extend the fingers at the PIP. Uh, and at this point, at the midpoint of the forearm between the flexor carpi radialis and palmaris longus, we'll needle in an anterior to posterior direction with no backdrop. Okay, so that is all of the musculature of the, the, the multi-articulate muscles, those muscles extending uh, from the forearm down past the carpals uh, to affect movement on the fingers. Uh, fingers and thumb. Uh, so now we'll move into the thenar eminence uh, muscles on, on thumb side. Now you'll find some similarities between muscles of the thenar eminence and um, well, I just drew a blank. Well, I have to know. Bear with me. I just had an absolute blank. Hypothenar eminence. Thank you. Wow. That was sad. Okay. Sorry about that. So on the thenar eminence, uh, the abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, and opponent's pollicis. You'll find that and we're going to be very specific in how to isolate each one of these muscles to the most benefit. Clinically, we're going to find that um, you can needle all of these with a single um, needle placement. It's not going to be necessary to uh, target these muscles with three different muscles in one of the most uh, sensitive areas of the body. Uh, but for our purposes here, I do want to go ahead and isolate um, each one in the event that you uh, discover through your assessment that maybe it's opponent's policies that is, that is critical. Well, it's got a slightly different needle orientation than does um, the abductor or the flexor. Uh, so you might uh, try to needle all three with the opponents as your needling approach. Uh, but let, let's let's dive into all three here. Um, I think we will come down to again. We're going to cover this in our, our our 3D anatomy. So let's just jump there. All right, and jump over to my library. for the thenar eminence. Thenar, not hypothenar, because I know the difference. Okay, so for uh, these three muscles, the abductor pollicis brevis, uh, its origin is gonna be the tubercles of the scaphoid and the trapezium bones, I'm trying to uh, get that. Uh, there is a connective tissue bridge between uh, the muscle itself uh, and, and the bony structures. Um, I don't have those in place right now because it covers a lot of other things that we want to see. Um, it inserts lateral aspect of the base, the proximal phalanx of the thumb. Whoa. And it's action, obviously, abduction of the thumb at the uh, carpal metacarpal, the CMC joint. Okay, so let's, let's hide that. We'll drop down here. We'll look at the flexor pollicis brevis. So abductor, um, absolutely pulling uh, that muscle, uh, that, that fifth, the thumb into the abducted position uh, or where we make our L. Uh, the flexor, because it's oriented just a little bit differently, is going to give us more of that flexion um, position, pulling into that flex position. Uh, its origin, the tubercle of trapezium, uh, the palmar aspects of the capitate and tra trapezoid bones. And then also the flexor retinaculum of the hand, which again is not uh, shown in this view. It inserts into the lateral aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. And obviously its uh, action is flexion of the thumb. Then we get to the 
rotate a little bit here, the opponent's policies. Uh, it's origin tubercle, the trapezium, um, and the flexor retinaculum. Again, that's not shown. It inserts into the intralateral aspect of the body of the first metacarpal bone. And here it's actually again opposing thumb towards the other fingers. So it's going to help bringing the thumb across. Flexion, I'm dragging my mouse like you know what I'm doing. Um, but pulling that into that opposition uh, motion towards the base of the, uh, the pinky finger. So let's pull that away and come back to now uh, the treatment. So for uh, abductor pollicis brevis, these are all gonna be based on the, the distal wrist crease. Uh, if you look at your own wrist, you see a proximal and a distal um, crease on the, on, the, on the palmer or the volar side of the hand. Uh, for, uh, for these, we'll talk about the carpal tunnel. Uh, the, the carpal tunnel structures are the trapezium tubercle radially, the hook of the hamate ulnarly. Uh, abductor pollicis brevis can be easily palpated, having, having the patient abduct the thumb while palpating the trapezium tubercle. One finger breadth distal to the, uh, distal, to the distal wrist crease. We're gonna locate that trapezium tubercle and then we're gonna move one finger breadth towards that MCP joint and we're gonna to needle toward and use the metacarpal as our backdrop. Abductor pollicis brevis, here the patient will be supine, shoulder uh, supinated resting on a pillow. Needle length will be uh, one and a half up to two centimeters, again, very shallow uh, needle location. Backdrop will be down to the first metacarpal. Here the palpable carpal tunnel structures are the trapezium tubercle radially in the hook of the hamate ulnarly. Uh, abductor pollicis brevis can be easily palpated by having the patient abduct the thumb while palpating the trapezium tubercle. One finger breadth distal to the distal wrist crease. We're gonna locate uh, the trapezium tubercle and then one finger breadth toward the MCP joint. Uh, we'll needle toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. So abducting, palpate, and needle location will be right there, right into the bulk of the thenar eminence. Okay, I'm going to, since I discussed it in the video, I'm going to move on to. For flexor pollicis brevis, here yeah. the patient, again, supine, forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow, needle length one and a half to two centimeters. Our backdrop will be uh, the first metacarpal. Um, again, we'll locate the medial most aspect of the trapezium tubercle, and then one finger breadth toward the MCP joint, We'll needle toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. So just a little more medial than adductor pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, slightly more medial. Again, you can resist or go through active flexion to isolate that muscle belly, get the bulk of the thenar eminence. And then let's move on to... Thirdly, for the opponent's pollicis, again, patient is supine, form is supinated, one and a half to two centimeter needle length, our backdrop here down to the first metacarpal. Um, here we'll locate the trapezium tubercle and then one finger breadth again toward the MCP joint, we'll needle toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. Again, we can resist opposition and, and identify <coughs> that muscle. Very difficult to differentiate each of these muscles uh, as we're needling through the, the hypo, uh, the, the thenar eminence. Uh, but to isolate opponent's pollicis, you can isolate there. And then that one finger breadth toward the MCP joint, um, we're gonna needle toward uh, and using metacarpal as that backdrop. So right there. Okay, so I went ahead and hit um, flexor and opponents. Uh, so let's move from there onto the adductor pollicis. Because it's not really part of the, uh, it's deep to the, uh, the thenar eminence, not part of the hypo, uh, include that as its own little category uh, as far as the adductor. Um, 
So let's jump back to our complete anatomy uh, to look at that. All right, so what, what you see here is uh, the muscles that we just looked at on the thenar eminence. And then you can tell superficial or, or deep to that is uh, the adductor polysis. So there are two heads, the oblique head, uh, which is uh, origin palmar aspects of the capitate bone and the basis of the second and third metacarpal bones. Uh, it inserts into the medial aspect base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. On the and obviously its action is adducting the thumb at the carpal metacarpal joint. Um, we look at the transverse head. Um, its origin, the palmar aspect of the body of the third metacarpal bone, and inserts into the medial aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. Again, its action is adduction of the thumb. So let's back. So on our treatment uh, piece here, uh, we're going to try to split the, the two heads here. We could uh, break those two out and needle, and, and we may find that we need to. We may need to find we hit need to needle the, both the oblique and the transverse head. In this regard, we're going to catch it right at its um, uh, uh, tendinous muscular tendinous junction of both of the heads. Uh, so here we'll palpate MCP joint by using a pincer grip uh, with the thumb on the thenar eminence, index finger, and the dorsal web space between the index finger and the thumb. We're gonna needle slightly proximal to the MCP joint and just inside the metacarpal. Uh, and we'll use our index finger on, on the opposite side to determine depth and make sure not to let that needle exit uh, the skin on the dorsal side. For adductor polysis, again, patient is going to be supine. Uh, forearm is going to be supinated, resting on a pillow. The length is here is up to two centimeters, and there is no backdrop. Adductor polysis attaches to the first MCP joint on the medial aspect. Uh, we're going to palpate the M MCP joint uh, there with a with a pincer grip, uh, with the thumb on the thenar eminence and the index finger in the dorsal. We have between the index finger and the thumb. So obviously my, needle, my hand is, is placement would be exactly opposite for demonstration purposes here with me being uh, both the uh, uh, clinician and the subject. Um, my thumb is on the dorsal side. In, in treating, you'd want your index finger on that dorsal side and your thumb palpating at the, uh, at the joint. Slightly proximal to the MCP joint and just inside the metacarpal using your index finger to determine depth and do not let the needle exit the skin on the dorsal side. So there at the end, the MCP joint needle right here. Again, using your uh, finger on the dorsal side uh, to make sure we get the adequate depth without penetrating through to the dorsal surface. Right there, adductor polysis. Okay, now we'll move on to the hypothenar eminence. Uh, so what, what I'll do is we'll take a look at the 3D anatomy and then we're gonna jump straight to uh, the kneeling videos that can give us our explanation on, on what we want to look at there. So let's come on down. Go into our library. Okay, so we're just gonna move just a little bit here. Uh, again, the three uh, very similar muscles than what we saw on, on the thumb side. Uh, first will be uh, the flexor, I'm sorry, the abductor digiti minimi, uh, origin here on the pisiform uh, and on the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, flexor carpi ulnaris is not on here, so uh, it's been removed so that we can see the other things, but that is our uh, abductor digiti minimi. You see with its, it travels laterally as it comes to insert the medial aspect of the base of the proximal uh, phalanx. I mean, you want to think medial um, on the inside, but given anatomical position, medial is on um, on this this piece, and that's where we get our our abduction. Uh, so to hide that. We'll look a little bit deeper at our flexor digiti minimi. 
uh, again, similar conversation about the, the, the hypo, the phenar eminence. Out on this side, well, if we have an issue with the with the with the pinky finger, we'll probably just use a single needle uh, to treat all three at the same time. Uh, in our case here, I do want to be able to break each of them out uh, for for purposes of seeing what we're doing here. Uh, but for flexor uh, origin, here's the hook of the hamate, so it's dropped off the pisiform. Uh, now it's on the hook of the hamate. Uh, it inserts the medial aspect based on the proximal phalanx of the finger, and in here its action is to flex the little finger. Uh, at its MCP joint. And then we get really small into the opponent's digiti minimi. Its uh, origin, again, hook of the hamate, uh, flexor retinaculum, and inserts into the medial aspect of the fifth metacarpal. Um, its action, again, opposes the little finger toward the thumb. Um, so we'll come back now, let's jump here. And let's look at the needling protocol. For abductor digiti minimi, uh, where we'll be supine, we'll have the forearm supinated, resting on a pillow, needle length here, one and a half up to two centimeters. Our backdrop will be down to the fifth metacarpal. We will, um, the, 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 the palpable carpal tunnel structures, again, are the trapezium tubercle, tubercle radially, hook of the <coughs> hemate, pisiform ulnarly. Uh, abductor digiti minimi can be easily palpated at the, at the distal wrist crease, here by having the patient abduct the fifth digit while palpating the pisiform in the hook of the <laughs> hamate. We'll locate the hook of the hamate and then one finger breadth distal from the distal wrist, wrist crease and one finger breadth toward the MCP joint. We'll needle toward and use the metacarpal as backdrop. Right. For flexor digiti minimi, position, again, patient in the forearm is going to be supinated, resting on a pillow with up to a two centimeter needle length, uh, backdrop again down to the fifth metacarpal. Here, uh, flexor digiti minimi can easily be palpated by having the patient flex the fifth metacarpal while palpating hook of the hamate. We'll locate the hook of the hamate and then one finger breadth toward uh, the MCP joint. We'll needle toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. Needle location is very near or the same as adductor, abductor digiti minimi. So again, needle placement here. For the opponent's digiti minimi, patient again, form is supinated, resting on a pillow, needle length up to two centimeters uh, with the back drop down to the fifth <laughs> metacarpal. We're gonna locate the hook of the hem A together and then one finger breadth toward the MCP joint We'll needle toward and use the metacarpal as a backdrop. And again, needle location is very near the same as abductor digiti minimi and flexor digiti minimi. So very similar. Very similar, if not identical, here on the hypothenar eminence. Again, be kind to your patients. Don't use three needles to needle uh, these structures, uh, one would be more sufficient, especially on the on the pinky side. Uh, those needle placements are so very close uh, that uh, one would absolutely uh, suffice in, 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 in targeting what we're wanting to do. All right. So we got the treatment, and let's move on to again. The, uh, the lecture is already, um, or the slides are already posted on um, the student portal uh, so that you can look at those directly. Uh, I should have an update to the app available um, within the next couple of days uh, so that all of these will actually be on the, on the app as well. Um, if you're looking at this six months from now, then it'll definitely already be there. Uh, so let's come on to uh, the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Uh, and here we're talking about um, our inner osseae and our lumbar holes. And I put this um, cross section in just to give us a view of, and we'll look at it in more detail, of the different layers uh, involved in the movement of, of the fingers of the hand. Um, down, I don't know if you can follow my mouse. Let's see. Let me lace. Let me use this laser pointer. There we go. 
<clears throat> so on the, yeah, there we are. Has a hard time staying caught up. Um, here we see the lumbricals. The lumbricals are the most superficial. Um, and what we'll see a little bit later, their attachment, they use uh, flexor digitorum superficialis uh, as an attachment uh, and origin site. Um, we have our interosseous, we have both our, our palmar interosseous, uh, interossei, and then we have our superficial or our dorsal interossei. And then superficial to that is our extensor digitorum. Uh, so uh, gonna be hard to differentiate uh, by needling just lumbricals without getting the palmar interossei. Uh, similar, it's hard to get um, dorsal uh, interossei without also going through and getting palmar interossei. Uh, if we are having issues in the hand, in between the fingers, between the carpals, um, al along the metacarpals, then odds are that we'll, we'll want to, to make sure we treat all of that anyway. Uh, one thing we wanna be aware of is whenever needling between the fingers, you want to stay away from direct midline. Uh, midline is where uh, we have our neurovascular bundle. Uh, so whenever we needle these, we'll needle just adjacent to the medial or the lateral surface of, uh, of the fingers themselves. All right, so the dorsal interossei. I'm gonna have to get rid of my pointer. All right, uh, let's just go straight to our um, complete anatomy for this. A lot easier to see it that way. So here we have both the interossei and the lumbricals. Okay, so we'll start with the lumbricals. And as I rotate, you can see Now you can see, well, I'm gonna to have to pull them all together. So there's our first lumbricle. There's number two, three, and four. So I'm gonna highlight all of the lumbricles. So again, their, their origin is off of, you can see that, well, now it's doing some silly stuff. So the origin is always off the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus. Um, this one's towards the index finger, but it's e each of these is the origin of um, our lumbricals. Uh, they insert the lateral aspect of the extensor expansion, uh, whether it's the index in uh, all, all of the fingers. Um, so here you can see number two, uh, it's insertion extensor um, expansion of the middle finger. And then in digits four and five, um, uh, again, the lateral aspect, the extensor expansion of, of those fingers. Uh, those are just a little bit different because there is a head on each of, of, of the flexor digitorum uh, profundus um, tendons on either side of them whereas digits two and three, it's just to the single side. And again, their action uh, is flexing the metacarpal phalangeal joint and extending intercar uh, interphalangeal joint, the IP joint of, of the finger. So those are the lumbricals. I'm going to select them again. I'm gonna fade those. All right, actually let's hide those. So lumbricals most superficial. And then we'll get into, let's undo that. All right. Then we'll get to the, uh, the Palmer interossei. So we have one on the index finger. We have one on the fourth finger. And then we have one on the fifth finger. So the three Palmer interossei. Uh, they, their uh, origin, uh, palmar aspect of the metacarpal associated with them, two, four, and five. They insert in the lateral aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx in the extensor expansion of the little finger. Their action is adducting the fingers, 
at the MCP joints and flexing the MCP joint and extending the IP joint of the respective fingers. Um, so those are the dorsal, I'm sorry, the palmar uh, interossei. So I'm gonna hide those. And then finally we get to the dorsal. So again, here it's digits two, three, four. Well, there's attachment there. So here's the fourth, third, second, and first. Um, their origin, medial aspect, body of the second metacarpal bone, lateral aspect of the body of the third metacarpal. So uh, attaching to, to the, the fingers on either side, uh, inserting into the lateral aspect, base of the proximal phalanx and the extensor expansion of the respective fingers. They laterally abduct the fingers uh, and they flex the MCP joint and extend the IP joints. So I, I go into some detail uh, on the interossei and the lumbricals because there are times where we need to uh, affect some change there in between uh, the digits um, and definitely structures that we can, muscles that we can needle. Again, we want to stay away from the midline and get as close to the metacarpals as we can uh, to avoid the uh, that neurovascular bundle in between. So let's come back. Okay. For the dorsal interossei here, patient is going to be supine. The shoulder is abducted 30 degrees. Uh, the forearm is pronated, uh, resting on a pillow. So the dorsal side up. Um, needle length will be up to two centimeters. There is no backdrop. With uh, the dorsal interossei, they can be palpated at the abductor side of digits two, three, and four. Uh, needling orientation is two finger breadths, it's anterior to posterior, two finger, two finger breadths distal to the CMC, the carpometacarpal joint, on the abductor side, which is both sides of the middle finger. We'll place our index finger in the web space between the dorsal, uh, between the fingers on the dorsal surface, and do not needle directly into the midline to avoid the neuromuscular bundle, neuro, neurovascular bundle. So uh, carpal metacarpal joint come up to finger breadths and again on the abductor side, which middle digit is both sides. Uh, second will be uh, over here and then fourth will be lateral. So two finger breadths, dorsal and erosii. In the hand, you have to be cautious for location of different venous structures. Uh, don't needle directly into the veins. Uh, make sure that you move them down. So if necessary, instead of being two finger breaths, you need to come up three or maybe even down to one. Do that just to avoid those veins. For the palmar interossei position, we will be uh, forearm supinated, resting on the pillow, so palmar side up. Needle length up to two centimeters and there is no backdrop. Precautions uh, for the um, neurovascular bundle in the middle of the, the, the finger space. Uh, here, it can, the uh, palmar interossei can be palpated at the ad adductor side of digits two, four, and five. Uh, needling orientation is approximately, uh, it's AP, one finger breadth proximal uh, to the MCP joint on the adductor side, which is closest uh, to the middle finger. Uh, place your index finger in the web space We'll place your, your index finger in the web space between the fingers on the dorsal surface uh, here so we don't go too deeply. Um, and again, do not needle directly in the midline uh, between the metacarpals to avoid the neurovascular bundle. Uh, we will needle through the lumbricals, uh, which are superficial to the interossei. So just one finger breath proximal to the MCP joint. So palpating dorsally, easy to note, notate that. Uh, so right there for the palmar interossei. For the lumbricals, the patient is gonna be, uh, have forearms supinated, resting on the pillow. 
the length will be up to two centimeters and there is no backdrop. The lumbricals can be palpated at the radial side of digits two, three, four, and five. Uh, needle orientation is anterior to posterior, one finger breadth proximal to the MCP joint on the radial side or closest to the middle finger. We'll place your index finger in the web space between the, uh, the fingers on the dorsal surface. You do not needle directly in the midline here to avoid um, the neurovascular bundle. Uh, but again, coming one finger breadth on um, proximal to the MCP joint, radial side closest to the middle finger. So very similar location of Palmer and Arasii. They're just superficial. Okay. So let's move past again. That's all. All, all of this information is on the student portal for you to, to look at. Bruise at your at your leisure. Um, done Palmer and Rossii and the lumbricals. So let's move now to the tendons and the ligaments. So if you thought the uh, the muscles, uh, the intrinsic muscles of the hand uh, were 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 specific, uh, the the tendons and ligaments get even more so. Uh, again, this is the, the technically most precise uh, thing that we'll do in dry needling is, is, is all of this. And it really honestly comes down to your ability to uh, palpate, uh, find your bony landmarks, uh, do your uh, resistive uh, muscle uh, uh, testing uh, to make sure that you're needling and identifying, finding the right muscles to find the right landmarks. Uh, lots of ligaments in and around the wrist will find a similar uh, situation when we get to the foot and the ankle. Um, rarely do we need to needle all of these things, but every now and then we do find uh, that there is an issue in, in some of this that we do need to be able to treat. And so I've made a very comprehensive approach to uh, the different uh, ligaments uh, here in the wrist and the hand. So let's just jump straight to our 3D anatomy for this. Detailed specifics about uh, all of that is, is written out for you, but I want to just get down to the nuts and bolts. So it's it's a little challenging to see, but I have marked uh, in in pink all of the tendons or all of the ligaments that we're going to needle here. Um, and although it seems like a lot, there's still a lot more, um, especially when it comes to ligaments of the carpals that I have not included, quite honestly, uh, with the location of the median nerve, uh, getting that deep, uh, probably not anything we wanna get involved with. Uh, so let's start, um, let's start way out here. Um, first, let's take a look at the superficial, there's a superficial and then a deep uh, transverse metacarpal ligament. Uh, the um, words, the um, the superficial uh, transverse metacarpal ligament um, it forms part of the transfer. I'm just going to read this here. Uh, part of the transverse fiber system, along with the palmar aponeurosis and the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. It's composed of uh, transverse fibers, which which travel across the apex of the web skin, extend um, into the digits. Um, and its function, uh, it limits the spreading of the skin of the distal palm and the separation of the adjacent fingers. So as you're uh, sitting and trying to do the Dr. Spock thing, um, it is this superficial and the deep transverse metacarpal ligament that prevents our metacarpals from spreading beyond um, a, a normal uh, position. They stay fairly close right there uh, through most of the functions, most of the things, movements that we do but it's those ligaments that prevent us from having that, that extra movement there. So there's the superficial. And then here we'll see the deep transverse. Again, uh, they work in conjunction uh, for providing that. Very similar, we'll move up to the thumb and we'll look at um, the distal and the proximal commissural ligaments. Again, their function, uh, proximal, uh, proximal uh, ligament that prevents separation of the web space between the thumb in the index finger, and we'll find 
the function of the distal commissural ligament. Again, same thing, uh, prevents uh, separation of the web space between the thumb and index finger. So that's what keeps us, uh, gives us that extra little bit of support to prevent that thumb from, from abducting uh, any further than, than necessary. Uh, if those weren't there, then we'd see a lot, of, uh, a lot more complication at the, uh, the CMC joint. Uh, so those are those. Let's stay on the um, palmar aspect. I'm going to remove just the palmar aponeurosis um, just so that we can see things a little bit better. Here we have, uh, so the flexor retinaculum um, is made up of, of two pieces. Uh, we have both uh, the palm, palmar carpal ligament, uh, and then we have here the flexor retinaculum or the transverse uh, carpal ligament. For that reason, we can needle, both of the, these we're gonna needle more on the, the radial side, uh, just to keep us away from midline. In a moment, we'll talk about the median nerve and its path here. We wanna stay um, a little bit on these two ligaments, especially on, on the radial side. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and remove Palmer carpal ligament. I'm just going to fade the transverse. So as you can see, we're looking in uh, underneath that palmar carpal ligament. There are a lot of ligaments uh, deep into uh, the carpals that, that we're not even dealing with, and you're welcome for that. Um, but there are more here that we do want to be able to pay attention to, um, and we will give you specifics on how to needle these, this is the radio scaphocapitate ligament. Uh, here we have the, the long radiolunate ligament. On the radial, um, I'm sorry, the ulnar side, we have the palmar radial ulnar ligament on the palmar side. Uh, we're gonna come all the way around. Um, let's get deep right here. Here is the ulnolunate ligament. Uh, we'll look at that. This will actually be one of our locations for kneeling the triangular fibrocartilage complex uh, composed of, of these three ligaments right here. Um, often see that with hand injuries of that uh, TFCC complex. Um, as we're rotating, we'll come around and very common here, ulnar collateral ligament of the wrist Bear with me here, and then getting on to the dorsal surface. Here we have the, the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. Proximal to that, we have the dorsal radial ulnar ligament. And then still proximal to that is the dorsal radio, radial metaphysial arcuate or the radial arcuate ligament. Uh, one more, a larger one on the dorsum is the intercarpal ligaments. Uh, a lot, lot larger uh, than we see on the, the palmar surface. And then lastly, we have the radial lateral ligament. So lots and lots of, of ligaments in here that can be involved. Uh, unless you see lots of hands, um, you may not find that you needle these very often. Uh, hand therapist is, is gonna be invaluable. Uh, for that, um, uh, but even if you have some sprains with uh, with your patient, being able to identify these 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 ligaments uh, is going to be very helpful. Not only in treatment, but being able to know where these ligaments are located, you can help identify if there is a strain or sprain of some of this this tissue. All right, so let's jump back now to. <coughs> this. So what I'm going to do is, again, you've got this information. It is very, very much spelled out specifically on how to get that. Each of the, the videos lays out the same information. So instead of duplicating, I'm going to come all the way down. Actually, let's do this one at a time, apparently. So we'll start with the commissural ligaments.
For the distal commissural ligament, the patient is going to be supine. The shoulder will be abducted about 30 degrees with forearm supinated, resting on a pillow. So palm up. The length here is going to be two centimeters. We're going to palpate the first CMC and MCP joints on the palmar surface. At midway between the distal half of the metacarpal, we'll needle from A to P with a slight angulation toward the second metacarpal. The ligament is superficial and not necessary to reach a backdrop. So first CMC and MCP joints on the palmar surface, midway between the distal half of the metacarpal needle from A to P, slight angulation towards the second metacarpal. So that direction. For the proximal commissural ligament, again, forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow. The length is about two centimeters. Uh, their backdrop is either none or the first metacarpal. So here we're gonna palpate the first CMC and MCP joints on the palmar surface. Midway between the proximal half of the metacarpal, we'll needle from A to P with slight angulation toward the second metacarpal. Ligament is superficial and not necessary to reach a backdrop. For the dorsal intercarpal ligaments, the patient's going to be supine, arm is placed on the abdomen, needle length here is one and a half centimeters. Where backdrop will be the scaphoid or the capitate. We're going to palpate dorsally for the dorsal radial tubercle. Right here. One finger breadth distally will be directly at the junction between the, uh, the proximal and distal carpal rows at the scaphoid and the capitate. We're gonna needle from dorsal to palmar, hitting that superficial backdrop. <coughs> so one finger breadth from that uh, dorsal radial tubercle. Right there. That's for dorsal intercarpal ligaments. The dorsal radial carpal ligament, again, patient's gonna be supine, arm resting on the abdomen, needle length of one and a half centimeters, uh, centimeters the back drop down to the lunate. We're gonna palpate dorsally for the dorsal radial, radial tubercle. Then we'll locate the distal medial border of the radius. We're gonna palpate the dorsal ulnar border, border of the carpals as the patient ulnarly deviates to feel the triquetrum. It'll be the bony structure between the distal end of the ulnar and the fifth metacarpal beneath the tendon of extensor carpi ulnaris. We're gonna needle from dorsal to palmar at the midpoint between those palpated structures onto the lunate uh, superficial backdrop. So again, dorsal radial tubercle. And then isolating the triquetrum, and it's gonna be midway between. That's for the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. For the dorsal radial ulnar ligament, again, supine, this time arm will be on the abdomen, uh, 1.5 centimeter needle with a backdrop uh, down to the ulna. We're gonna palpate dorsal, dorsally for the dorsal radial tubercle. Then we're gonna locate the distal medial border of the radius. We'll palpate the distal um, dorsal medial ulnar border. Uh, we're going to needle from dorsal to palmar, less than half a centimeter proximal to those points at the midpoint between the palpated structures onto the ulnar superficial backdrop. So dorsal radial tubercle. Then we're going to back up um, more proximal, half centimeter, landing onto the ulna. for the dorsal radial ulnar ligament. The dorsal radial arcuate ligament. Here's some supine, arms resting on the abdomen, one and a half centimeter needle, backdrop down to the ulna. Again, palpate dorsally for the dorsal radial tubercle, then locate the distal medial border of the radius. We're gonna palpate the distal dorsal medial ulnar border. Uh, we're gonna needle from dorsal to palmar, uh, approximately one centimeter proximal to those points at the midpoint between the palpated structures onto the ulnar superficial 
backdrop. So dorsal radial tubercle, locating the ulna, and then we're gonna drop proximal about one centimeter, landing onto the ulna is our backdrop for dorsal radial arcuate ligament. For the palmar carpal ligament of the flexor retinaculum, here patient's gonna be supine, shoulders abducted 30 degrees, forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow. Needle length will be one and a half centimeters and our backdrop will be down to the radius. We're gonna palpate the radial styloid process. And then we'll palpate the flexor carpi radialis, uh, the tendon there at the carpals. We're gonna needle anterior to posterior at the level of the radial styloid process, just lateral to the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis with the radius as a backdrop. So radial styloid process, here's my flexor carpi radialis, and that tells me I want to be lateral right there. And that is for the palmar carpal ligament of the flexor retinaculum. For the transverse carpal ligament of the flexor retinaculum, uh, forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow, needle length one and a half centimeters. Here there's either no backdrop or down to the carpals. We are going to palpate the radial side of the carpals for the trapezium tubercle. Okay, that forms the attachment of the transverse carpal ligament. We're gonna palpate the flexor carpi radialis tendon at the carpals, and then we're gonna needle in an anterior to posterior direction from the level of the trapezium tubercle toward the tendon of FCR. Right there. For the palmar radial ulnar ligament, uh, the patient's going to be uh, supine, shoulders abducted, 30 degrees in the forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow. Here, the needle length is going to be one and a half centimeters. Our backdrop is down to the ulna. We're going to palpate for the ulnar styloid process. We're going to needle from one finger breadth anterior to the ulnar styloid process on the dorsal aspect of the ulna from anterior distal to proximal to land on the distal aspect of the ulnar head. The right one finger breadth anterior, not from the dorsal, but to the palmar side for the palmar radial ulnar ligament. For the long radio lunate ligament, the uh, patient will be supine, the shoulders abducted 30 degrees, the forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow. Here we will have a 1.5 centimeter needle. Backdrop here is the scaphoid or the lunate. We're going to palpate the radial styloid process and then palpate the flexor carpi radialis tendon at the carpals. We're going to needle anterior to posterior at the level of the radial styloid process just lateral to the tendon of flexor carpi radialis with the scaphoid or the lunate as a backdrop. Right there. For the radio scaphocapitate ligament, again, the forearm is gonna be supinated, resting on a pillow, 1.5 centimeter needle down to the scaphoid. We're gonna palpate the radial styloid process. Uh, we're gonna needle uh, a half a centimeter to one centimeter or a half a finger breadth distal and medial to the RSP over the flexor carpi radialis anterior to posterior with the scaphoid as a backdrop. For the radial collateral ligament of the wrist, uh, this patient will be supine arm resting on the abdomen. Uh, needle length here is 1.5 centimeters with a backdrop down to the scaphoid. We're gonna palpate the radial styloid process and we're gonna place our finger between the radial styloid process and the CMC joint of the thumb to appreciate the midpoint. 
where you're simply gonna needle in a lateral to medial direction with the scaphoid as a backdrop. We'll needle through the extension polish as long as before the radial collateral ligament. So I'm gonna move into this patient position to appreciate this distance. Radial styloid process, base of the thumb midpoint. Again, we will needle through uh, extension polish as long as before radial collateral ligament. So, right there. <coughs> For the triangular fibrocartilage complex, uh, here the patient's gonna be supine, the shoulders abducted 30 degrees for him is supinated resting on a pillow. Needle length is gonna be two centimeters and our backdrop here is the scaphoid or the lunate. We're gonna palpate the ulnar styloid process. We're gonna place our index finger distally to appreciate the midpoint uh, between it and the triquetrum. We're gonna palpate for the flexor carpi ulnaris. We're gonna needle from the distal point between ulnar styloid process and the triquetrum and posterior to the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. Angulation will be posterior at 45 degrees relative to the anatomical position and approximately 10 to 15 degrees with a backdrop on the scaphoid or the lunate. So flexor carpi radialis, got my space there. So 45 degrees and then 10 to 15. It's land into the triangular fibrocartilage complex. For the superficial transverse metacarpal ligament, uh, supine position, shoulders abducted 30 degrees, forearm is supinated, resting on a pillow. The length here is 1.5 centimeters. The backdrop is down to the proximal phalanx. Uh, we're gonna palpate for the proximal segment of the MCP joint of digits two, three, four, and five on the palmar aspect. And then one finger breadth distal to the joint, uh, to the joint line, will needle in an anterior posterior direction with the phalanx as a backdrop. <coughs> For the superficial transverse metacarpal ligament. For the deep transverse metacarpal ligament, forearm is going to be supinated, resting on a pillow. We'll use a one and a half centimeter needle, and our backdrop will be the distal MCP articular facet. Uh, here we're going to palpate for the proximal segment of the MCP joints of digits two through five on the palmar aspect. At the joint line, we'll needle from the midpoint between the adjacent MCP joints. Um, to the lateral edge of the target MCP joint to avoid the neurovascular bundle. That's for deep transverse metacarpal ligament. For the ulnar collateral ligament, uh, patient would be supine, arm would be uh, placed on the abdomen. Needle length here is 1.5 centimeter and there is no backdrop. We're gonna palpate the ulnar styloid process and then one finger breadth distal from that location will needle in a medial to lateral direction with no backdrop. On the, on the, okay, so you managed to get through all of the ligaments of the wrist and hand. And I know there are lots of them. Again, when, whenever you do find yourself with a situation in the hand, if you're not certain, use this reference material to both I'd diagnose where you feel the problem is. You know, what, is, what are we dry needling more often than not? We're dry needling something that's tender, something that it's inflamed. That tells us where our, our problem is. And, and our needle locations uh, give us a great idea of what ligaments, muscles, tendons are involved. So, uh, both, uh, I always say it's both, dry needling is both therapeutic, but it's also very diagnostic in helping identify what we're actually doing. So we're going to move down. Let's move into, next will be the median nerve. So we look at the median nerve. Again, we talked about the uh, ulnar radial uh, in conjunction with the elbow. Uh, but the median nerve itself arises from branches uh, from the lateral medial cords to brachial plexus, courses through the anterior medial part of the, the arm, the forearm, and the hand, 
and ultimately terminating supplying the muscles with the hand. Um, most common area of entrapment, definitely in the carpal tunnel. It can happen a little bit uh, more proximally, uh, possibly deep in the, uh, uh, between uh, flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. Uh, so um, our median nerve and our carpal tunnel protocol we'll find are very, very similar uh, because of you know, what they are. Uh, so with, <clears throat> with the median nerve, um, here we've got several uh, things that we're gonna look at. Um, I'll start so our target structure again, the median nerve. Uh, and, and when I say the nerve, we want to be adjacent to it. Definitely we don't want a needle into the nerve. Um, at, at the wrist crease, that median nerve sits between palmaris longus and the flexor carpi radialis. Um, uh, we, can, we can definitely, especially in the carpal tunnel itself, we can do some needle manipulation there. Um, say 10, 15 seconds worth of that. Uh, electrical stimulation can be provided up to 20 minutes. Um, ideally, a low to high frequency, three hertz up to 75 to 100. So our very first uh, needle placement, we are gonna actually thread into the carpal tunnel. Uh, nine, nine structures inside that carpal tunnel. The, um, and there'll be a question about that at the end of the uh, lecture. Uh, but basically for this very first neural location, we're gonna find this proximal wrist crease and we're gonna identify the mid thenar crease origin more distally. So here we, if you look at your own hand, you've got this uh, the crease in between the, uh, the, the thenar, hypothenar eminence. And at, at the most proximal aspect, usually it'll bifurcate a little bit, the crease will. We're gonna go just a little bit uh, uh, ulnar side at, at the termination of that crease. And that's gonna let us get into that carpal tunnel. Um, when we do that, we're gonna, we're gonna place, so there is our needle placement side. And then we're gonna advance it in a, in a distal manner through the carpal tunnel. And most importantly to know here, it's gonna be parallel and deep to the palmar surface. So if you look at your own palm, um, that needle needs to go in through that area, but then run parallel so that we don't end up going deep uh, and hit the median nerve, but also we don't go superficial and exit uh, the palmar surface itself. So nice, and, and it's gonna end up being about a half uh, to one centimeter in depth as we travel through that parallel course. Uh, here needle length uh, can be three centimeters. It could be a little less, uh, but no more than three. For secondary locations, uh, we're gonna come up from that palmar crease and both at two finger breadths and at four finger breadths, uh, we'll, we'll place needle there. On the most proximal uh, two finger breadths, more proximal from that crease, it's, that needle is gonna be at a fairly oblique angle to give some respect to uh, the median nerve as it's coming more superficial as it enters the um, carpal tunnel, uh, we move out uh, another two finger breaths and it's gonna be a little bit less oblique. So it's gonna be a little bit more perpendicular to um, the skin there. Here needle length is gonna be about one and a half centimeters, especially in, in this needle, the very first uh, needle along this line. The second one can be a little bit longer. We're gonna come up uh, and those will be into the flexor retinaculum. Um, when we get to, um, especially the carpal tunnel uh, protocol, we'll also needle into the palmar carpal ligament and the transverse carpal ligament. And we'll, we'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Our secondary muscular locations, we will be two finger breaths, uh, distal uh, from the cubital crease. Okay, we've already done that one. Um, oh, cubital crease, sorry. Two finger breaths from the cubital crease at the margin of uh, flexor carpi radialis and pronator teres, so right there. Uh, and, and these are designed to just simply follow the course of the median nerve as it's coming around uh, into the anterior aspect of the forearm. Um, lastly, we'll uh, place one in a midpoint between uh, this point and the points more distally. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact, and, and that one can be fairly perpendicular uh, to the skin surface. Um, we can also go through the medial, shows it here, the medial forearm group. Um, and then um, the thenar group, uh, what, which is what median nerve is, is innervating. Uh, 
segmentally, we can look at C5, C6, 7, 8, and 1 um, for uh, the, the spinal nerve segmental groups. So let me... On the median nerve, I uh, wanted to demonstrate a couple of, of issues here. We'll also look at it when we get to lab. Uh, we have one needle location that is um, challenging, but um, definitely wanted to go over that one and the subsequent ones. So we, we have a location at the proximal uh, wrist crease. Uh, we're identifying this mid thenar crease. Um, we can see its origin. I don't know if it's very challenging to see, uh, but where the mid thenar crease comes down uh, and terminates more all, uh, radially here, uh, we've got our proximal uh, wrist crease and then our more distal. Well, just a little bit further is the location where we're interested in. And so with this first needle placement, so here is the location of where the needle we want to, to come in, but the important piece is our angle of orientation. So as we come in, we're gonna run parallel to the palmar surface. So basically we're gonna thread right through that part of uh, carpal tunnel. So that's, that's the most challenging of, of needle placement number one is in getting that location and being parallel to that palmar surface. There are two more. Uh, needle locations uh, at two finger breadths and four finger breadths proximal uh, to the distal risk risk crease. Uh, here we want to uh, uh, regressively go oblique. So uh, proximal uh, or the distal uh, wrist crease. We're going to drop, actually we'll drop one at the distal wrist crease, but it's going to be fairly oblique. So we're not going to be uh, as deep as one might think. So fairly oblique. As we move through this, the, the two finger breadths distal, we can get a little bit more uh, nearing uh, perpendicular. So each of these is going to have a difference in their obliquity. Uh, and that's just to give uh, respect to uh, the location of that median nerve as it approximates into uh, the carpal tunnel. Okay, so let's take a look at that again in our 3D anatomy. Uh, you know, carpal tunnel uh, is something we see all the time. Um, and so worth a little bit of time to look at a little bit uh, more, a little bit closer. Okay, so here we are looking at, uh, you can see I've left, taking the other nerves out, you see the median nerve uh, coursing through, we come up, we can trace it all the way um, between the biceps and uh, the triceps. Uh, it sits in between biceps and brachialis here. Uh, as we're coming back down, then we can see uh, as it travels underneath uh, the flexor retinaculum, uh, the palmar ligament here. Because of the program, it doesn't show you the uh, transverse uh, carpal ligament uh, that actually holds all the carpal contents in its place. Uh, but what we do see is uh, what we want to do as far as our needle location. So number one, uh, we started here. This is the very first needle location that we talked about. This is the one that's going to run parallel through the carpal tunnel into and parallel to that palmar surface. Okay, as we travel up, I'm gonna bring that right there. Um, we definitely want a needle into the, uh, the thenar muscles. This, because it's not shown, this would be the needle, <clears throat> excuse me, the needle placement for the transverse carpal ligament. Here is needle placement for the palmar carpal ligament. Next, we see this two finger breadths from the, the crease. This is going to be the most oblique needle angle, uh, need, need, obliquely back towards uh, cranially. 
uh, this next one, two more finger breadths will be less oblique. We're going to come all the way up in between. Um, so here's the cubital crease. Come on. Between the cubital crease, uh, pronator teres has been removed. Can't see that. Uh, but this is the next location, uh, again, approximating near uh, the median nerve there. Uh, and then we'll find a spot mid midway between the little needle in there. The needle, um, let me pull that back. Uh, here is just needling through that, that common uh, medial uh, muscle group uh, that we did in the very first uh, lab that we did. And so that's, uh, so I don't have, have a, spots we could also do, again, those cervical uh, segmental levels that give us um, the, the innervation for the nerve itself. So that's what we do for the median nerve. We'll also find that it's very similar to what we do for carpal tunnel. So our regional diagnosis protocols, first we'll just hit the carpal tunnel again. Um, there may not even be hardly anything different, but we'll take a look at it. Uh, then we'll look at uh, osteoarthritis of the thumb, very common in, in our older uh, folks with uh, have done a lot of manual work, uh, crocheting, any sort of manual labor, Tennessee, uh, some uh, thumb OA. We'll look specifically at uh, trigger finger or uh, stenosing tenovitis. And then we'll look at a lot of the uh, potential that we have for tenosynovitis, including uh, de Quer veins. So we'll We'll start by taking a look at carpal tunnel. But once again, let's take a look at what's, what's in here. Uh, so in the carpal tunnel itself, again, just a cross section of what's happening. Uh, on top sits the transverse carpal ligament. And then inside, uh, of course, the carpals themselves make, make the floor. Uh, inside, uh, we have the four tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis. And the four digits, uh, the four tendons of flexor digitorum profundus. We also have the flexor pollicis longus, and that in addition to the median nerve. So nine different pieces uh, or different structures inside that uh, carpal tunnel. Obviously, if we get inflammation of any of these, whether it's the synovium around uh, the, 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 the superficialis or the profundus, uh, or the flexor pollicis longus, any inflammation there, or inflammation of the transverse carpal ligament can create compression onto that median nerve. And that's ultimately what we're trying to, to get rid of is that inflammation so that nerve can function a little bit more properly. So let's, let's scroll through here. Again, we're gonna find that this is very well similar, if not exactly the same as what we do for the median nerve. Uh, we've got uh, one thing I do differently is I do, um, let's get to here. Uh, on the transverse carpal ligament, we wanna be both medial and well, here's transverse carpal on the palmar. So that's the palmar carpal, this is transverse carpal. We wanna be uh, both medial and lateral. So median nerve runs right in between. So to affect change on that, on that ligament, we wanna be on the lateral and medial aspect of that. Uh, of the bony pieces that are forming that bridge. Second, we want to come up into the flexor muscles of the forearm. We want to hit the, the thenar eminence. And then we can always hit our, our spinal segmental locations. And then specifically, we want to make sure that we're doing everything with that median nerve. So there we'll do that, uh, that, that needle through uh, the carpal tunnel itself. We'll do one two finger breaths, one four finger breaths, uh, one, two finger breaths distal from the cubital crease, and then one midway between. And whoop, go back here. So I want to double check that in our anatomy. To show that library. Again, so for for that, one one main uh, difference is in adding uh, the needling into our our ligament. That would be the main difference. Uh, so whether you're dealing with median nerve, whether you're dealing with carpal tunnel, um, I would probably still add that in there 
as well. Okay. Now, for thumb OA, there's going to be several things that we look at here. Um, number one, we're going to go after that CMC joint. I mean, we're just going to get as close as we can in, into that joint as we can. Uh, that is more than likely the side of their pain, their discomfort. Uh, so we needle into that. Second, uh, we'll come hit the, uh, the thenar muscles, uh, the extensor pollicis longus, uh, brevis, and then the abductor uh, longus. Anything that's putting uh, force, compressive force on that uh, CMC joint. Uh, lastly, we can catch uh, the commissural ligaments and then the transverse carpal ligament as well. So let's take a quick look at that in, in our library. So again, we'll want to catch uh, all, all of the muscles that are affecting a pull, uh, a load onto that CMC joint. Um, catch the transverse carpal ligament, catch the, the CMC joint itself, muscles of the thenar, and then the commissural ligaments. And we, we tend to see some pretty good results with uh, dry needling for OA of the thumb. If it's, if it's too far advanced, we may find that we just have to use uh, some sort of splinting to, to offset that. But very frequently, if we catch it early enough, uh, then we can, we can really make some changes with that. Still don't need a pull. All right. So we'll go to trigger finger or stenosing uh, tennis endivitis. We see a lot of people... Uh, with this uh, issue um, that square veins as well, but let's look at uh, this uh, trigger finger. Uh, so with, with trigger finger, I mean, obviously we know what happens is uh, we get um, some expansion of the tendon itself. It can pull underneath and we'll look at it uh, in 3D anatomy, but this is the A1 pulley right here. And that, that bulb of, of inflammation if you will, the knot uh, can, can get trapped on one side or the other of this pulley. And essentially what has to happen is that bulb has to snap back through um, for that to move. And so um, results in what we call the, the trigger finger. Uh, so for that, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna needle uh, the A1 pulley itself. We'll needle the more proximal uh, synovial sheath. Um, because uh, the lumbricals have their origin off of that, that tendon, we want to needle the lumbrical as well. Um, we can definitely come up and needle into flexor dig superficialis and profundus, uh, since that is the muscle, the, the muscles that are giving that load to that, that tendon, we want to make sure that they're uh, squared away. Uh, so let's take a look at it and our complete anatomy. So again, what we're looking at is, um, well, most definitely probably one of the easier things to start with uh, is just needle the muscles themselves. See if we can reduce the load on that tendon. Um, very good approach. Anytime dealing with tendonitis, deal with the muscles specifically first uh, that are causing the problem and see if that will make it go away. If not, especially with the hand and the feet, then we can come down. But if we know we've got a specific uh, problem with uh, trigger finger, then we'll catch that A1 pulley right here. It's just um, so that proximal to the superficial transverse metacarpal ligament. So we can needle there. Uh, out of curiosity, um, transverse carpal ligament is a continuation. I guess I should say the distal commissural ligament is a continuation of superficial transverse metacarpal ligament. So just odd information. Uh, so anyway, A1 pulley, which get it there. 
So there, this row is the A1 pulley. Here is uh, the number two and so on. Uh, so we want to catch that here. We want to come just a little bit more proximal and get into the synovial sheath as well. And I've got a video demonstrating this on that, uh, uh, extensor digitorum. Then we're going to we're going to manipulate these things and see if we can get some movement there. Likewise, we also want to catch the lumbrical associated. And I'm just showing this on the first uh, finger. Um, it can actually happen on any of them. First one is fairly common, uh, but it can happen. You know, we get trigger finger. Uh, in the thumb, we, we can happen anywhere. Uh, so those three are what you want to look at, as well as the the offending muscles that are responsible for that tension in that muscle. All right. So I do want to show um, a treatment that I did uh, not too long ago uh, for tenosynovitis of stensor digitorum. Uh, now, I had an issue myself where I had inflammation of extensor uh, digitorum, the tenosynovitis, uh, after doing a lot of work with my hands, and I did the same treatment on myself, um, just using a single needle. Obviously, I can't do two at the same time. Uh, so it's a very nice approach. Um, so basically, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to needle in one area of the tenosynovium. We're going to needle in the other direction. As you can tell, these are angled almost like a V. And we're going to use some unidirectional rotation to have that um, tent around the needle. And then we're going to manipulate that back and forth uh, to try to, one, elicit uh, um, a response out of the tissues directly, but two, a mechanical mobilization. So some unidirectional rotation, get that to, to catch. And then we're going to rock back and forth. Again, different methods of mobilizing that's that, that that synovium and we get pretty good results with that so we have a number around the wrist around the ankles uh, we also see it in the um, intertubercular groove and in the, in the humerus uh, a lot of areas that have uh, um, tino synovium and this is a really this is a really nice way of treating that uh, so again, what is tenosynovitis? Uh, it's broadly defined inflammation of a tendon and introspective synovial sheath. Not all tendons have a synovial sheath, um, but very common wrists and ankles. Um, and it can derive from a great number of distinct processes, it can be idiopathic, it can be infectious, uh, and it can have an inflammatory cause. Um, the most common form is idiopathic or stenosing. And that uh, is such as trigger finger, trigger thumb, and more commonly, we see to queer veins, which is um, tenosynovitis of abductor pollicis and extensor pollicis. Abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis on the dorsum of, or on the abductor side of the thumb. We'll, we'll perform the Finkelstein test uh, to, to, to determine if, if we have an issue there. And so that's tenosynovitis, that treatment that I just demonstrated on extensor digitorum, can also be done at each of the respective locations in and around the wrist. Um, so what, what you'll find as we go through for the each respective tenovitis problem we're seeing at the wrist, there's a respective muscle more proximally that needs to be dry needled to be released as well. Again, most, most of our tendon issues that we deal with um, have an associated muscle tension problem. And so uh, and kind of being the neuromuscular piece, we want to release that first. Uh, so for uh, extensor digitorum, uh, it will be uh, four finger breaths um, into, again, extensor digitorum. We're going to do that play the piano uh, business to find that muscle. Um, I have lots of very specific instruction on how to do each of these. You may find if you don't, see lots of hands, you may see that you do this two or three times in a career. If you see lots of hands, you may find that this becomes very invaluable for dealing with issues uh, around the wrist. Uh, for um, uh, tennis advice of extensor dig, um, again, we're gonna, we're gonna be distal, we're gonna be proximal, we're gonna needle, um, and we're gonna do that needle mobilization. We're gonna move the tendon 
We're going to try to move it inside the synovium. We're going to try to manipulate the synovium as well. So I think what I've done, I'm going to come in and take a look. I think I've taken a look at all of the tenosynovium to kind of demonstrate um, what we have here. So let me come to that. Yes, okay. So as we roll around the wrist, you can see there are lots of synovial sheaths that we have that could be problematic. Here on the abduction side of the thumb, again, here we are looking at Citropolisus brevis, adductor pollicis longus. They actually share a conjoined, uh, it's shown here as two separate, but they are connected. Um, Tino synovium. And again, that is the, the area we'll do that Finkelstein test to see if we elicit a problem there. If so, this would be a perfect place for, uh, for that. And this is our de Quervain's Tino synovitis uh, for, for those, probably one of the more common. Uh, we also see it, um, catch up, uh, flexor carpi radialis. There is one deeper at flexor pollicis longus. Definitely in the, well, not palmaris longus. Deep, we can see that we have them for uh, a common flexor tendon sheath. So the flexor digitorum profundus, flexor digitorum uh, superficialis uh, share a common uh, sheath. Interestingly, you can see that sheath extends all the way out to the tip of the, the pinky finger. Moving on around, tenosynovitis can be present in Citricarpi ulnaris. Go back where that's here. And in extensor digiti minimi. Probably most common. Um, is when we see it with the veins on the thumb and occasionally we'll see it on extensor indices. Uh, but a similar condition, like I said, when we see it on the palmar aspect uh, with uh, trigger finger, again, the stenosing tenosynovitis. In the video of the uh, manipulation uh, that we talked about, uh, great way to treat that if you don't have access to um, a high-powered laser or something like that. Uh, I still feel like this is a very good treatment uh, approach to reduce that inflammation. And here we can actually do some mobilization of that, that tissue. All right. Oh, wrong screen. Let's go back. Okay. So all, all of the specifics are laid out. Um, if you find that you have specific tenosynovitis, um, every potential uh, tenosynovium in the wrist is addressed. Uh, so I'd recommend pull out your uh, reference material, use the app, let's go find uh, that particular piece um, and perform that, that needle manipulation uh, in the tenosynovium. But let's move all the way now to... our post lecture assignment. So one of the few times, even with a lot more structures, a lot more things to look at that we're gonna finish like four minutes early. So fantastic. So here for our post lecture assignment, <clears throat> four, four little things. And all of this information is in the lecture that we just had. Number one, I want you to name nine muscles directly involved in movement of the thumb. I know it sounds like a lot, but there are that many. Uh, number two, I want you to name the contents of the carpal tunnel. There's nine of those things. Three, when needling the opponent's digiti minimi, name the three superficial muscles that will be needled before reaching that. And number four, not that you would, but if you were needling the flexor digitorum superficialis from the dorsum, name four muscles that you would needle 
through before hitting flexor digitorum superficialis. And that's, that's that. Wrist and hand. Up next, uh, advanced dry kneeling of the hip. I've broken the next two lectures, the hip and the knee, into two lectures apiece. There's just a lot of information that we want to get to. Uh, and we see a lot of things with the hip, a lot of things with the knee. We want to make sure that we have plenty of time for both of those. Um, I forget exactly when this next lecture is, uh, but I'll send update out uh, on that. So here we are. Um, lecture 10, we've got lecture 11. So we've got the hip, the knee, the ankle, the foot, and then lastly, uh, the pelvic floor. And so we are almost through. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free to yell and uh, let me know what's going on. And uh, hopefully um, we'll see you in either two weeks or three weeks uh, for the start of the hip. Any problems or questions, yell and let me know.